start out by thanking Brenda for helping. We've been publishing our lessons online. If you've not been familiar with that, we uh, have a YouTube channel. We're going to be feeding them to the website as well um, so we can share our truth message um, with the whole world. And um, it actually feeds into our talk today. Uh, a lot of you realized recently that I took my daughter to college up in Amherst, Massachusetts. And uh, while we were being shown around, uh, there was a, a mountain there called Mount Tom. And I don't know where it got its name, but anyway, um, I was told that that mountain was the mountain that uh, influenced the scene in The Grinch That Stole Christmas, where he, he was up on the mountain and he slid his sled down into the town. Uh, so that area, that geographical area, influenced uh, one of our great writers of our time, Dr. Seuss. And um, I was thinking about Dr. Seuss when I was making this talk, and especially the story about Horton Hears a Who. And to refresh your memory on the story is... To this big elephant who's got big ears was walking through a field of clover. And he heard this speck of dust yell out, hey, we're here. And so he decides he's going to vow to protect this little universe that he's discovered on this speck on this clover. So as he's carrying this clover around, all of his friends are ridiculing him. All of them are saying, you're crazy, Horton. There's no one there. We, we don't hear them. Uh, and so they're not there. Their, their voice does not make a difference. So he begs them. He, he finally was communicating with the mayor of Whoville, who says, well, maybe if we can get everyone together and make as much noise as we can, then... Maybe your friends will be able to hear us and they will, they will save us and protect us. And the story goes on to talk about all the little obstacles that happen to Horton as he's trying to protect this world, as he's trying to let them know that it really exists. The buzzard takes the clover and drops it in a field of clover, and Horton finds himself wandering through a field of clover for hours and hours and days and days, trying to refine that clover. The story is really fascinating because it also has some references and inferences to the dropping of the atomic bomb in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Very, very clever, clever writing um, weaved amongst the children's story. But this is not about a children's story. What happens in the story is when the mayor of Whoville discovers that there's one voice, it's a little small, small boy named Jojo who's playing with his yo-yo, is not making any noise. He's not letting his voice be heard. And it was only when Jojo decided to cooperate they took him to the top of the Eiffelberg Tower, mm -hmm. and he let out a yop. And the yop was the difference. The yop allowed all of Horton's friends to know that he wasn't crazy, that they weren't going to boil him in a, a batch of bezel nut juice. The yop was the single most important yap in the whole story. So we let out our yaps. Are we letting out our yap? I want to share with you a personal thing, and let me just clarify for anyone's here. This is not an endorsement of this community, of this candidate, but I want to share with you a story. I personally support Gary Johnson as our president. Now, what comes from this support of Gary Johnson is the argument that my vote is wasted. 
And I've had both sides of the coin, both the Democrats and the Republicans, have said to me, why are you going to waste your time voting on someone who's not going to win? And um, I thought, well, you know, that's a really good question. That's a fair question. Why am I going to take time out of my day on Tuesday, November 8th, go and take part in a voting process for a candidate that 100 million to one is not going to win the presidency? Why would I take my energy and my time to even bother with going to support this candidate? And both of my friends on both the right and the left side are saying, you're going to cost our candidate the presidency. A vote for Gary Johnson is a vote for Hillary. A vote for Gary Johnson is a vote for Trump. Well, who's right? I mean, I don't know. But my convictions and my conclusions have led me to support this candidate. Um, for, and, you know, be glad to discuss it with anybody. Again, this is a personal, this is not the endorsement of this community. I want to make that clear because I will tell you that we support as a community your choice, whatever choice you feel led to in your heart to support that candidate. Even if you wanted me to go in and check the box for you, I would do that. So, but it's, the argument came out, why would you want to vote for anybody who's not going to win? And it left me with this thought. We don't vote for somebody because they're going to win. We vote for somebody because they support what we believe in. And it's not about winning. It's not always about winning. It's about standing for what you believe in. So I'm giving Gary Johnson my yop. He's got my yop. Because I do believe that we would be better served with a third party. And I would love to see a third party into the debates. Now, I know there's a lot of ridicule and criticism about Gary Johnson, and, and uh, maybe rightfully uh, so, and, and justified. Um, but it's more about the bigger picture. It is about a political system that I believe is a little bit controlled, and I'd like to see that control be loosened. And I can't do it unless I give my yop, unless I take the time to go down and stand for something that I believe in, no matter how unpopular it is, no matter how discouraging it can be. It is so important to stand for the things that you believe are right, whether the world believes it or not. This is, in some ways, somewhat of a small issue, but it does point to other bigger issues and other people who have had that chance to give their yop. Most notably, Susan B. Anthony. I was very pleased to find out when I was researching Susan B. Anthony that she really had a beautiful way of expressing herself in law. And in 1873, she was convicted of voting. She was convicted of a crime and charged $100 for her fine. But she did it anyway. She let out her yop. Her voice had to be heard. Her voice was heard. But don't you think in 1873, Susan B. Anthony didn't have some friends and say, Susan, why aren't you in the kitchen? Why aren't you doing what women do? Why, aren't you, why are you rocking the boat? It's a man's world. Let the man handle the politics. I can only imagine the words that came 
to her from those who thought she was maybe a little bit off the deep end. I love this. Resistance to tyranny is the obedience to God. I love that. There were some other great quotes, too. One that stood out to me was, anyone who says that uh, God told him to do something I have a great distrust in. (laughs) (laughs) Susan B. Anthony was somebody who said, I need to let out my yop. I need to be heard. I need to let the world know that I exist. The starters of great movements like this are never popular. But I like to quote Shakespeare when he says, This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell, my blessing season, this in thee. It's important to be heard. What can the community learn from this? Well, there's another somebody who had to be heard in his lifetime. Martin Luther King. So much of Martin is lost beyond the I have a dream speech. We remember the I have a dream speech. We remember the march in Washington. We remember how this young Baptist minister from Uh, Birmingham Church was called to action when Rosa Parks was discriminated against and she refused to give up her seat on the bus. At that moment in time, probably only several hundred people had heard of Martin Luther King. Maybe those in his community and in a circle of friends. Certainly not millions. The world didn't know who he was. But he stood up for what he knew was right. He stood up in the face of injustice. A couple of days after he made a stand, he got a phone call at his house that threatened him and said, You've got three days to get out of town or you will be killed and we will bomb your house. I would maybe venture to think that most people living in the deep south, given that threat, would have tucked tail and ran. We have to remember this was the Martin Luther King, a 26-year-old Martin Luther King, a young man who had just celebrated the birth of his daughter a month earlier. He wasn't having meetings with the president then. He wasn't doing anything that he thought would maybe get him national attention. He was addressing a specific issue in his community. Now it led to that, but we, if we put it in the context of the time that it happened, had he or you or I received a call like that for standing up for something, what would we have done? As the story goes, he could not reach his father in Atlanta, who was, I guess, a real anchor and emotional support for him. And that was the moment that he had a real awakening in his kitchen, and he got on his knees and he prayed over a cup of coffee. To asked for that spiritual guidance that he needed in that most critical moment. Do we always turn to prayer in those critical moments? Might be a whole other sermon. (laughs) But he decided at that moment after praying to let out his yacht, to continue to let out his yacht, to be heard to allow Rosa Parks to be heard. Even in the face of unpopular opinion, even in the face of ridicule, even in the face of the threat of death, even in the 
confines of an environment that were very hostile toward any blacks that decided to stand up and say something. They weren't supposed to be heard, those people. Had it not been for these courageous people standing up for what they believe in, the world would never be changed. So I asked the question, what can we do as a community to make a difference? Because we're socially minded people. I guarantee all of us have our opinions of this world. We're socially conscious. And I thought, as a leader, what could I do to inspire something to take action? And this idea came to me last week after I, I gave the talk and I was talking, I mentioned this briefly to Brenda, but I never shared anything with her beyond that. So I decided that maybe one thing I'd like to do in the face of all of these police shootings and uh, the Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, whatever, was I'd like to allow Unity Center in Leavenworth to make a a proclamation, a statement. And I'm going to read this to you. Now, I will preface this by saying this is a proclamation that is certainly open for discussion and it's open for debate. It's nothing that I am um, issuing at this moment uh, without great consideration from this community because as a community, I believe that I want the community's voice to be heard, not just me as a spiritual leader of this community. But I think I want you to hear these words and I want you to think about them. We can discuss it uh, after the service and, and, and I'll, I'll make copies of this. You can take it home. And, um, and I want us to think, what can we do as a community to make a difference? That's the impetus of, of this letter here. I'm gonna read it. This statement from Unity Center in Leavenworth is an open acknowledgement to people of color in our community and our world. We officially recognize the deep pain and the hurt feelings that have been felt in the face of racial oppression, police profiling, and other discriminations endured by those of color. Our faith and our church community views mankind all as one. The pigmentation in your skin does not differentiate us in God's eyes. Human beings can be limited and can focus on our differences in the physical plane. However, it is the goal of our community to live spiritually minded. With this mindset, we know that all of us are equal in God's eyes and that each of you are our brothers and sisters. Too often, churches are silent in the face of social issues. This proclamation is to publicly state that we hear the cries of the African-American community and others of color for social justice and right action and that our community is here to do what we can do to support those affected. Years of pain and suffering cannot be swept away by these few words. These words cannot take away the events that happened in Ferguson. These words cannot take away the events that happened in Tulsa. These words cannot take away the events that happened in Charlotte. These words cannot take away any of the pain of those who have suffered. Yet we offer this proclamation in the spirit of healing. We offer it as a step on a bridge that will bring all people together. Regarding law enforcement, the Unity Center in Leavenworth recognizes that there are many in law enforcement who serve with dignity, pride, and honor. For those that do, we salute them. In addition, we acknowledge that there are many who have paid the ultimate price in making our community safer. For those who have, we honor them. We know that all is not well between the police and the African American community and those of color and trust have been breached. It is the position of the Unity Center in Leavenworth to help in the healing process and in restoring trust and stand with the African-American community and those of color in the face of any issues that embody racism, prejudice, or injustice at the hands of authority. In closing, 
Unity Center in Leavenworth encourages an open dialogue toward healing racial tensions. We invite community leaders to come together and we make our facility available as a place where dialogue, discussion, and emotional healing can occur. We also encourage all that are negatively affected by racial discord to be open to forgiveness. Only when one's heart is open to forgiveness can real change be made. We strive to be a conduit to build trust in making our community and our world a better place. With love and brotherhood, Reverend Chris Foster. So let's ask again, what can we do as a community to make a difference? This is our yop. This is our opportunity to say, you know, we can look around and we can focus on the little things in, in keeping and sustaining this community and this church. But thinking outside of ourselves, thinking outside, and even though we may be small in number, we can act big. We can make a stand. We can be a place of healing. We can be a place of love. We can be a place of compassion and understanding. We do not have to play small in God's world. In this world here, we are here to show up because our voice does make a difference. What we say is certainly open for discussion. And this is not a dictation or a, or a forcing anyone to do anything or say anything they don't want to do. This is a community issue. But it is important. It is so important. Because without this, we're pacifist. We don't allow anything to, nothing's going to change. We're not going to say to the world, hey, at least we believe this. We have to stand on our faith and we have to put it out there and let people know that we are here to help in whatever way we can. Even if it's a small thing, there's a song by Janice Stanfield. I cannot do all the good the world needs, but the world needs all the good that I can do. We as a community need to do all the good that we can do. And if it's offering this space to have a forum, if it's having meetings, if it's showing up and in, in support of, of a, an atrocity, we have to do all the good that we can do. This is our walk as Christians. <clears throat>